Hey everybody, this video is called The Defeat of Absalom, and so tonight we're going to continue our pass-through study here in the book of 2 Samuel, looking at the 18th chapter. We're going to look at the defeat of Absalom, and as well as death. And in so chapter 18, verse 1 through 4, it says, Then David numbered the people who were with him, and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. Then David sent out one-third of the people under the hand of Joab, one-third under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and one-third under the hand of Itay, the Gittite. And the king said to the people, I will also surely go out with you myself. But the people answered, You shall not go out, for if we flee away, they will not care about us, nor if half of us die, will they care about us. But you are worth ten thousand of us now, and for you are now more help to us in the city. Then the king said to them, Whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood beside the gate, and all the people went out by hundreds and by thousands. And so David, we see that he set his army into three divisions under the leadership of Joab, Abishai, and Ite, the Gittite. And David knew that the commander belonged out in the battle. And the last time, David did not go out to the battle. And when that happened, we see that David fell into the temptation back in chapter 11 with Bathsheba. And David, he may have wanted to go, but the people recognized that the death of David would mean sure defeat, and Absalom would then be secure in his kingship. And the people's words echo what Ahithophel had earlier pointed out to Absalom back in the last chapter, verses 2 and 3, what we looked at yesterday. And so David was persuaded to remain at Mahanaim, and the people saw his life valuable, that he could bring re reserves if needed, and understood that it would be hard to fight against his own son Absalom, as another reason why David should not go out into the battlefield. And the army was willing to take care of their king in sacrifice and danger. We see that they were devoted to their commander-in-chief, the king. In verse 5 it says, Now the king had commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains orders concerning Absalom. And so we see that David, he ordered his three commanders not to harm Absalom. And the four uses of the young men, Absalom imply that David tenderly viewed Absalom as a youthful youthful rubble that could be forgotten. In verse 6 through 8 says, So the people went out into the field in battle against Israel. And the battle was in the woods of Ephraim. The people of Israel were overthrown there before the servants of David, and a great slaughter of 20,000 took place there that day. For the battle there was scattered over the face of the whole countryside, and the woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. And so a dense forest existed east of the Jordan River and north of the Jabok River in Gilead. And that's where the battle was raged. And amazingly, because of the density of the trees, they rugged nature of this terrain. The pursuit through the forest would result in more deaths than the actual combat. And David's loyal fought against Israel because Israel wasn't loyal to David. And Israel was seduced by Absalom's charisma and power. And quite a few verses here, 9 through 17 says, Then Absalom met the servants of David. Absalom rode on a mule. The mule went under the thick bows, boughs, or bows, however that word is, of a great terebinth tree, and his head caught in the terebinth. So he was left hanging between heaven and earth. And the mule which was under him went on. Now a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, I just saw Absalom hanging in a terebinth tree. So Joab said to the man who told him, You just saw him. 
And why did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have given you ten shekels of silver and a belt. But the man said to Joab, Though I were to receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For on our heron, the king commanded you and Abishai and Itay, saying, Beware, lest anyone touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise, I would have dealt falsely against my own life. For there is nothing hidden from the king, and you yourself would have set yourself against me. Then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. And he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. And the ten young men who had bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom and struck and killed him. So Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing Israel for Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into a large pit in the woods and laid a very large heap of stones over him. Then all Israel fled and everyone to his tent. And you know, this chapter just goes haywire in these set of verses that I just read. And Ether Absalom's neck was caught in the fork formed by two of the branches that was growing out from the large oak tree. Or his hair got caught in a tango of the thick branches. And the terminology and the context favor that his hair was caught. And one of David's soldiers who refused to disobey the order of the king recorded in verse 5 to treat Absalom gently. He had nothing done for the suspended prince. Four ounces and... 25 pounds was approximately 10,000 shekels of silver as well. And the spear of Joab killed Absalom while Joab's armor bearer struck him to make sure that he was dead. And in this action, we see that Joab disobeyed the direct order of the king. And King David said, do not kill Absalom. And that's what Joab did And Joab, he goes on to recall his soldiers from the battle. And Absalom was buried in a deep pit that was covered over with stones. And perhaps this was meant to be symbolic in nature of stoning, which was a legal penalty due to a rebel son, as we studied back in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 20 and 21, which we did back in April. And a heap of stones often showed that the one buried was a criminal or an enemy, as we studied back later in May, in Joshua 7.26 and Joshua 8.29. And we see that Joab, he did not hesitate striking Absalom, though he knew that the king commanded him not to do so. And he did so in his own personal conviction. He thought that this was in the best interest of King David and in Israel's best interest to show Absalom justice and not mercy. In a preacher, British pastor, G. Morgan Campbell, he stated that Absalom only received what he deserved as a murderer, a traitor, and a rapist. And if you remember Tamar, he was Tamar's rapist back in chapter 13. In the highest interests of the kingdom, his hand was raised to slay Absalom. And we would probably see Joab as being correct, but he was not right in disobeying the king. And later on in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 5 through 6, Joab is going to be held accountable for what he did to Absalom, both by God and eventually by David. In verse 18 says, Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up a pillar for himself, which is in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. He called the pillar after his own name. And to this day it is called Absalom's monument. And so Absalom had memorialized himself by erecting a monument 
in his own honor. And there is today a monument, a tomb in that area called Absalom's tomb, perhaps on the very same site of which Orthodox Jews spit when they pass him by. And King's Valley was east of the city of Jerusalem. And in chapter 14, verse 27, that we looked at a couple weeks ago, we saw that Absalom had three sons. And they were unnamed in the text, all of whom had died before him. And this shouldn't be shocking, as we know that Absalom was a self-centered, self-promoting type man. In verse 19 through 27, it says, Then Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, said, Let me run now and take the news to the king, how the Lord has avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said to him, You shall not take the news this day, for you shall take the news another day. But today you shall take no news, because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, Go tell the king what you have seen. So the Cushite bowed down, bowed himself to Joab and ran. And Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, said again to Joab, But whatever happens, please let me also run after the Cushite. And Joab said, Why will you run, my son, since you have no news ready? But whatever happens, he said, let me run. So he said to him, Run. Then Ahimeaz ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. Now David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchmen went up to the roof over the gate, to the wall, and lifted his eyes and looked. And there was a man running alone. Then the watchman cried out and told the king, and the king said, If he is alone, there is news in his mouth. And he came rapidly and drew near. Then the watchman saw another man running. The watchman called to the gatekeeper and said, There is another man running alone. And the king said, He also brings news. So the watchman said, I think the running of the first is like the running of Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, he is a good man and comes with good news. And so verses 19 through 27, Ahimeaz wanted to take David the news of Israel's victory and Absalom's death. But Joab, he wanted to spare Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, the burden of being the messenger of the bad news. And Ahimeaz was faster than the other runner. He was the guy that you want on your cross-country team. But since the messenger was someone David knew, he assumed that it was going to be good news. And to wrap up the chapter here, verse 28 through 32, says, So Ahimeaz called out and said to the king, All is well. Then he bowed down with his face to the earth before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord your God, who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimeaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servants and me, your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I did not know what it was about. And the king said, Turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. Then the Cushite came, and the Cushite said, There is good news, my lord, my king, for the Lord has avenged you this day of all those who rose against you. And the king said to the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise against you to do harm be like that young man. And uh, actually there's going to be another verse after. But Ahimeaz concealed his knowledge of Absalom's death as Joab requested. And David's question is an example of the great bond of love between a parent and child. And compared to the Cushite, Ahimeaz was a better runner but a worse messenger because he didn't know his message. And the Cushite's response wasn't so much indirect as culturally phrased. And the Cushite told David that Absalom was dead. In verse 33, Then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. 
And as he went, he said thus, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And, you know, verse 33, I can sense that he was speaking in distraught. He was speaking in grief. And my son is repeated in that verse five different times. And David lamented the death of his son, Absalom. And in spite of all the harm that Absalom had caused to David, David was still preoccupied with his personal loss in a mournful way that seems to be consistent. And in David's weakness as a father, it was an unwarranted zeal for such a worthless son and a warning about the pitiful results of sin. And as I mentioned earlier with the pastor, the British pastor, G. Morgan Campbell, he stated on this passage that it is not enough for parents to train their children to be godly, but they must train themselves in, first in godliness. And I really like that quote that G. Morgan stated, because as parents, we can raise up our children, tell them all the right things to do. But as parents, we need to lead by example and we need to be we need to be accountable to ourselves as parents. We must train ourselves to be up, you know, in holiness with the Lord. As parents, we shouldn't be telling our kids to read the Bible if we're not open in the Bible ourselves. And David, he wanted to die in place of his rebellious son. And any parent that is going through grief over losing a child, you know that feeling that you wish you could replace what happened and to be put in their place. And so to wrap up today, we look today at David putting the army under the three captains. And the way the army was devoted to David, may we take that as a spiritual analogy where we as believers be devoted to our king of kings Jesus Christ and we saw that David's command to the captains and the Absalom's armies are defeated and we saw that Joab he was the one responsible for killing Absalom and we looked at Absalom's pillar of himself and we are introduced to these two runners sent to tell David of the outcome of the battle. And we see that David learns of Absalom's death from the Cushite who arrives after Ahimeas. And we witness the sad ending, seeing that David goes into a grief of great mourning over the loss of his son, the, his son's death. And theologian professor Robert Payne Smith commented on verse 33, so in the cry of David, we actually hear the cry of God for his lost children. Christ did what David could not do by dying. And Christ died as a sinless man, unlike David. And, you know, Christ died in the place of rebellious children. When we were ungodly, God sent Jesus to die for us and that's gonna you know where i want to wrap off you know with that mindset as we approach celebrating and remembering the birth of christ that we remember that jesus came to die for that purpose to bring us rebellious children to the father to be adopted into the family of god and we are 75 percent of the way through our study here in second samuel I hope you have a great rest of your evening. We will see you tomorrow. We're going to step out of our study in 2 Samuel for a topical Saturday to be announced in the morning. And so I hope that you join in tomorrow as well. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. God bless.